Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is a game that had to face many different challenges to actually be good. It needed to be bigger and better than Remake, but it also needs to channel Final Fantasy VII, the original, as the remake that it is, while still having reasons to exist and having changes. There were many questions that the developers had to ask themselves to make this game, and what different gameplay systems, mechanics, and inspirations can we take and put into this game to reach that goal? What they ended up doing is something very bold and strange for a big AAA game in this space. It really tries to take the JRPG genre in a different direction and to innovate and evolve a specific flavor of JRPG. It hinges everything that it does on one thing, its pacing. And because of that, and with the monumental task in front of them, it doesn't always hit. But the final result is a beast very much worth discussing, because there has been so much work put into making this game what it is today. Every little element has been thought about and designed carefully, and while it doesn't always hit that mark, Man, does it try. So hi, I'm Mugthief, and I make videos on things that I care about or that I think are interesting. Remember to like the video if you like the video. It truly helps out. So let's talk about the absolutely insane design of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I'm going to break this video up a little differently than normal. I'm going to talk about the elements of design in the game from the perspective of three other games that I think it drinks heavily from. And those are Xenoblade Chronicles, Mario Galaxy 2, and Yakuza. And the strangest one of those is actually Xenoblade Chronicles. Because it helps answer the question, how do we bring in the open world JRPG structure of old into modern times? The whole overworld map with constant random encounters that take up large portions of your time and can end up making the game feel like walking, stopping, fighting, walking, repeating this for about an hour, and then getting to a story beat and then repeating over and over again, really doesn't fly these days. When it does actually work, it requires a lot of quality of life improvements and a lot of tinkering and thinking carefully about how you make that combat system feel more like an interesting puzzle. I think the best example of this is something like Octopath Traveler 2, a game that is still very underrated. But Final Fantasy VII Rebirth needs to be this big AAA flagship title, not this harkens back to retro inspirations title. So the design of its open world leans closer to something that I identify with Xenoblade Chronicles, which are these semi-open worlds, these big regions that are not seamlessly connected but you can travel between and that are all quite big in their own right, that have all of these little side objectives scattered throughout them. You have your more traditional side quests, but you also have a series of different activities, be it combat encounters, nodes to unlock, crafting materials to collect, all of these little things that all feed together into a central progression mechanic that keeps you engaged in that exploration and that combat as something enjoyable to do, even though in reality, if you think about how this sort of open world and quality of life features of being able to ignore combat work today, is that if you just wanted the story, you could just completely ignore everything in that open world and run to the next marker. But by having this structure of different fun side activities with different rewards to offer you, and having a careful balance between rewarding the player for doing them, and not making the player feel punished if they decide to skip some of them, you end up with these very large environments that you can explore, you can enjoy, feel rewarding to explore within themselves, but never really hinder the progression too much. Just the general layout and the feeling of exploring these environments and the different things you do in them reminds me a lot of how Xenoblade does it. Now, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth and Xenoblade, being these modern open-world JRPGs with a similar structure, each have their pros and cons. But I think it's still a good comparison point to how Rebirth has tackled creating that open world. Where Final Fantasy VII Remake felt like a very streamlined game, like a narrative action-adventure game with RPG mechanics put into it, the open world in Rebirth really helps it feel more like it's a proper RPG when you're in it. But they still made most of it very optional. That's not something easy to do, and I think it's quite impressive. Possibly the most important comparison is Mario Galaxy 2, because this one helps answer the question, what is the identity of Final Fantasy VII, and how do we translate that into gameplay? I said before that Rebirth hinges everything that it is on its pacing, and a lot of its pacing is very similar to Mario Galaxy 2. If you've never played Galaxy 2, which I highly recommend you do, 
It's a game that's often considered the best 3D Mario game because its whole idea is to throw out all of these crazy experiments that the team had and didn't implement into Mario Galaxy 1. The final result is a game that very rarely plays like a traditional 3D Mario platformer, and instead takes those mechanics and puts them into the wackiest situations possible, and sometimes just throws out those core mechanics altogether to do something completely different. That whenever you jump into a new level, which is very often, you have no idea what to expect. And even if you don't like what the game is throwing at you, it's only going to be at most 5 or 10 minutes, so you'll move on to something completely different soon enough. The sheer amount of innovation that is constantly happening, how much everything changes all of the time throughout your playthrough of Galaxy 2, leaves you with a huge smile on your face even when you don't like what you're actually playing through, which the quality is so high that rarely will you not enjoy it. And Final Fantasy VII Rebirth does the same thing, but instead of every 5 to 10 minutes, every 30 to maybe an hour. I'm not exaggerating when I say I took notes of this and noticed that I had at points in this game spent more time playing cards than I had actually using the core combat system. You'll be playing Clash Royale, the Queen's Blood card game, going on pseudo stealth missions, riding a dolphin, doing rhythm mini games, all sorts of things that recontextualize what it actually means to play this game and that will happen all of the time. Tying back into that open world exploration, even just engaging in side quests can very frequently lead to very different gameplay experiences. And that's when it's not part of the main quest and you're tasked with spending five hours at the beach doing a ton of different mini games from playing Rocket League but with animals or doing a piano recital. It's often overwhelming how much the gameplay style changes and what the core focus of the game is from moment to moment. In the end, you feel like you never know what to expect next. You don't know what you're actually going to be doing in this game 30 minutes from where you are right now. That creates a sense of excitement as you keep playing because you want to find out what you're going to do next. Who knows what it could be? But that does come with some downsides. These are not five minute levels. These can be more involved and you can spend large amounts of time doing things that maybe you're not a fan of. As much as many of those things are optional, many are not and you would be missing out on significant chunks of the game by not engaging with them. And sometimes this chaotic nature and structure can make it feel like you're deviating from the main path and the main story for a little bit too long, kind of losing the thread of what it is that you're actually doing or why you're doing it. But that's an issue that is also present in the original Final Fantasy VII to some degree, which is famously the one with the most minigames of the series. But we'll talk more about the narrative consequences of it in a moment. For now, I want to talk about how it answers that question of identity. The developers here have decided that the identity of Final Fantasy VII is in each unique and memorable moment in the story. It's not about walking and engaging in the combat system and reaching a new point, it's about what you do at each of those points. The original is a game where the developers tried to take advantage of that technology, of moving on to the PlayStation 1 and using that to their advantage to just see how creative and crazy they could get by doing very unique scenarios, going off the wall with some of the gameplay mechanics, be they the core mechanics with the ATB, or all the minigames present. And that helped make each point, each stop in the adventure that much more memorable. So when deciding how to really convey that identity today, what they ended up with is not making it a cutscene simulator, it's not making it a boilerplate walk from place to place open world and fight a bunch of things type of game. No, it's about expanding on each of those moments not only in the time they take, but in the systems and mechanics you use to interact with those moments. Things that were tiny, unique, and memorable before are now full gameplay sections with their own mini-games, and these mini-games can be very complex and have a lot of systems put into them. Small, brief moments of respite have been expanded into these large sections of just hanging around and doing different stuff in town. They put the full force of the AAA budget not behind making the best crafted action sequences in the world, or the craziest cutscenes, or the most impressive linear path ever, but instead tried to touch a little bit on everything, while focusing a lot on making each of those moments their own special thing. I don't think that's going to be universally accepted. This is a very subjective question. 
And for the people who disliked the minigames in the original Final Fantasy VII, well, congratulations, now there's more. But this structure of jumping from thing to thing all of the time conveys that same wide-eyed ambition and creativity that the original did way back when. A period in game development where it felt like a common question was, why not? Hey, if we're going to be at a beach, why can't we race a jet ski? Well, hey, why don't we make it a dolphin? And if there's one thing that I feel, and this is a very personal opinion with Final Fantasy Rebirth, is that many of the things in this game were first just cool stuff they wanted to do, and then they tried to justify them in gameplay mechanic. It feels like they said, hey, it would be cool if you could do this, and then they made it, and then somebody asked, well, what's the point of it? Do they get like an item or a reward or something? And then they put in a reward for it because that often feels like the afterthought and the core of it is we put a bunch of cool stuff in this game. This is a decision that had to be made and it's a very interesting one to say the least. I also think it's quite bold to make this really big AAA highly anticipated game a game where you spend a lot of your time doing these different sorts of things that many people that maybe aren't as familiar are going to be constantly surprised at. But that is what they decided was the identity of the game and they stayed true to it and put all of that work and budget behind them. While many times the core gameplay of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth can feel a little bit shallow, or how it can feel like it's doing too many different things, the truth is that there was so much work put into each of these tiny sequences that that's where that Mario Galaxy 2 comparison really comes in. They're all done with a love and craft to them, even if they're one-offs. But often they're not, they're expanded into their own little systems, things like the piano simulator that's in the game, kind of. Sure, they couldn't be full-on games on their own, but they're way beyond just a simple minigame. And that really shows us how important it was for them to make it a core part of the game, to make it the identity of it, that each moment is meant to feel special. And that's where the third comparison point comes in, because that might sound very familiar to things that Yakuza does. While in Yakuza you have a main story and it often does change its gameplay styles with little segments and mini games often, it's a lot of the side stories that really go wild and incorporate all sorts of different things throughout the game. But the key difference between Yakuza and Mario Galaxy is that Yakuza needs to reinforce all of that and justify it narratively. Rebirth tries many more things than your average Yakuza, but with that comes the price to pay of having to make it all narratively focused in the way that Yakuza does and work better or worse. Here the rewards can't be exclusively I got to do something different for a while, it needs to be what is the narrative purpose of this, how does this drive the story forward, what interactions between these characters that I love does it unlock or lead to. At its best, Rebirth contextualizes all of this craziness into things that make you smile and make you love the characters more, and at its worst it feels like it's throwing in hour-long diversions that go nowhere and added nothing. Now that is subjective, but there is an objective truth as well that just some of the things it does are dumb, even when they are one-offs. Part of the opening sequence where you get to vacuum Mako feels like a huge waste of time. Pushing a crate for over a minute, very slowly over a bridge, feels like a huge waste of time. And these are the moments where the game is the most confusing, because it's not lacking in content, it didn't need to pad out its runtime. There's probably too many different things in this game, to be honest. So there is a possibility here that they needed a little bit more of editing, a little bit closer to Yakuza in the balance of the main game plus all of the side diversions or even when they are part of the main quest, all of these alternative gameplay styles. And that's why I said that it's a game that hinges on pacing, even if it doesn't always nail it. A lot of that will be subjective, but it does have a very specific creative vision of how it wants to bring in the original Final Fantasy VII into modern times. And it's something that is really worth discussing, because it's really off the wall, it's really strange but highly enjoyable and does make you smile more often than not. 
I do highly recommend Rebirth, especially if you're a fan of Final Fantasy VII or any Final Fantasy. It's doing a lot of different things from Remake, but it's also being very true to what that game was. It retains the scale, the spectacle, and it just bumps everything up to 11 when it comes to those other things that the devs consider is the identity of Final Fantasy VII. It's not just a retelling. It's trying to be an expansion of it. Not everybody will agree, and I think very few people will say that it's perfect. There are a lot of things I don't really love about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. The combat system when fighting flying enemies can be very annoying like it was in Remake. Some of the production values, some of the performance on the PS5 is not great. But that is obviously not the main focus of the video. There's a lot more to talk about from this game. This is just about the design. But I will say that if this doesn't win best soundtrack of the year, and probably most soundtrack of the year, I am committed to eating a cactuar. Just the soundtrack is worth the money in my opinion. But it's still really interesting, and overall, a great time. So anyways, I'm Mugthief, this is how I like to talk about games, and if you think this is interesting, maybe a little bit different from what you normally see on YouTube, please subscribe. I normally do very big, over an hour long analysis of games, and if you still want one of those for Rebirth, let me know in the comments below. There's a lot of games coming out I want to cover, so I really want to know if it's something that I should dedicate my very limited time to, or not. I do want to quickly shout out how much support the channel is receiving. So many new subscribers, people liking the videos, leaving wonderful comments. It's a lot, and I'm incredibly grateful. A little bit overwhelmed, not gonna lie. but. I'm going to keep doing my best to bring you the best videos possible. I don't have the words to express how thankful I am for all of that support and how that leads to things like having a console and a capture card now, something that I never thought I could allow myself to do on the limited budget that my daytime job has provided for so many years. But it's thanks to you that I can do that now. And I take that support very seriously and I'm very thankful for it as I hopefully continue to make better and better videos. Thank you so much for watching. Have some fun, enjoy some good video games. And as always, I'll see you again very soon.